Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Whenever you ask a paranormal investigator or a researcher of the paranormal how they got started in their work, the answers are always similar. They say that they had witnessed something that they cannot explain, something they wanted to know more about. This activity that is witnessed is an invitation, an invitation to explore something dark, something that can consume your soul. However, sometimes God allows these activities for a meaningful purpose. Sometimes God uses such activity to draw people close to Him and to lead that person on a path that will glorify the Lord and help people in distress. Now Paratruth presents The Calling, a paranormal invitation with special guest Patrick Meekin. What's up, para fans? My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And you are listening to Paratruth Radio. Woo, woo. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, folks, for joining us today. We are very, very happy to be here. Aren't we, Justin? Always. Always, guys. Always. Yeah. Anyway, before we get into tonight's discussion with our very special guest, there was something that was brought to my attention earlier this week. And, you know, I'm going to just give you a little bit of information about what it is that happens to be going on. I don't have all the details. I don't have a full understanding. But what I have heard is very intriguing for me, enthusiasts out there, and of course, my brothers and sisters in Christ who are also in the paranormal community. This particular person, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to name any names here, folks. A friend of mine told me of a elderly woman who is in a nursing home. And this person has been experiencing some interesting things. Her and her uh, co-workers have been experiencing interesting things around this elderly woman. And, you know, when I think about all the stuff that was told to me, it sounds very, very similar to what you would see in someone with schizophrenia. However, there are some interesting things that are questionable. Now, basically what's going on is that this elderly woman has begun to hiss and growl at people trying to help her. She is extremely weak. She cannot stand on her own. She cannot walk on her own. She cannot sit in her wheelchair on her own. She cannot even get out of bed on her own. There has to be someone there, one or two people there to lift her up and move her from place to place. And yet, people have been walking into this room, workers, nurses, helpers, going to help her, and they find her nowhere. Then they look over and she's in a closet, standing by herself, staring at a wall. There's been another time where someone had walked in and saw a table flipped over on its top, legs sticking straight up and just papers and books scattered across the floor. And this elderly woman sitting in her wheelchair, staring at the wall. It has been said that she has uh, spoken in a voice that is not of her own. And there have been other instances where it would appear, I'm not going to get into details, but it would appear that she would have to have some sort of superhuman strength to be able to pull these things off, uh, you know, in particular moving certain objects that are just way too heavy for a, a woman in her condition, especially someone who's just too weak to stand up. And of course, like, like I said, 
the growling, the hissing, the the weird voice that doesn't sound like her own, the uh, staring at the wall. You know, these things are all very similar to schizophrenia. And I know a lot of people may question and say, well, schizophrenia is kind of brought on by demons anyway. Okay, I'm not going to agree or disagree with you. I think some people believe that. Some people believe, as I do, is that uh, these disorders, these mental conditions, or just disease in general, can be brought on due to the fall of man. It might be an, a natural outcome. I don't know for sure. There's no guarantee. You know, I think God is more than capable of healing us, though. But these feats of strength in which things are being moved and turned over and so on and so forth, things that this woman cannot do is very interesting. Something that it's just a little too weird to be considered a mental disorder. So the question is, is there some kind of demonic oppression, affliction, possession even? I don't know. I don't know for sure. However, I do want to take a moment, and I know I don't do this often on the show, and there's a reason for that. The scriptures tell us not to pray in public. Now, of course, there's certain situations where we do. I pray before dinner, even in the public. I pray with my church. Of course, there's a reason for that. We are to pray with the church. But I don't like praying on air all the time, you know. But in this particular instance, I would really like to. I would take a mo- like to take a moment to pray and just get everyone to pray with me, just to follow along and pray these words uh, to God. And especially those of you who are believers in Christ, who believe he died and rose again for us and are truly saved by his grace and mercy. If you just take a moment, because the scripture tells us in Matthew seventeen twenty one, it says, But this kind, referring to demons does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Some demons can be cast out by a simple word. Other demons can only be cast out if you ask God to do it for you. And so with that, I'm just going to take a moment here to pray. Please join along because the scriptures say that when more than one or more than two believers come together, God will answer your prayers. Lord, Heavenly Father, I'd like to take a moment just to come to you in humility and ask you to help this this woman, this elderly woman who is in this nursing home. The people, the workers there, the helper, they are afraid. They are afraid for their lives. They go in there in numbers, in pairs of two, or even in groups of three, because they're scared of what they might witness. I don't know the, everything about this person or the situation, but you do, Lord. You know who this woman is. You know exactly what's going on. You know whether or not there's a demon involved here. I was told earlier today, Lord, as you know, that if things get worse, they may call me to go and visit. And I don't want to have to do that if you can do it for us, Lord, because I know you can. Not all demons can be cast out with a word. Sometimes we have to pray. And Lord, I ask now for you, if you're willing, through your mercy and your grace, to bless these people, to cast this demon out of this woman, Lord, out of her home, out of this building, and replace this evil spirit with the Holy Spirit. Allow her to take in the Holy Spirit so that the demon cannot come back with seven more that are more wicked than itself. Father God, I've seen you work in the past. I've seen you cast out demons. And I pray now, again, that you do the same thing. That these workers, these people who witnessed fearful things, scary things, Lord, that are just, you know, frightening them, I pray that they witness a miracle. That they see, that they see your hand, Lord, at work. Again, Lord, I pray that you cast this demon out, cast it out far from this woman, far from these people, and bring salvation to her and my friend and all of the co-workers that have witnessed the horrific events that they claim to have seen, Lord. I just ask and pray that you're with them, that you protect them today, tonight, and every day from here on out, Lord. Be with them. Be with us, Lord. And all these things I ask in your Son's precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, folks. 
With that said, we do have a topic, a very interesting topic to discuss today. Uh, <clears throat> we have a very special guest. He is the author of Nightmare in Holmes County and 225th Street. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Patrick Meekin. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be on your program. Thanks. You know, what we like to do at the beginning of each show is just to allow our guests to give some information about themselves, uh, maybe to promote their books. We'd like to discuss both books today, by the way. So if you'd like to just help people where they can find you, where they can buy your book, et cetera, et cetera, go for it. Okay. Um, again, my name is Patrick Meekin. Uh, you can contact me through my website, which is patrickmeekin.com. Uh, last name is spelled M-E-E-C-H-A-N. Uh, there are links on my website to uh, link to Amazon to download Kindle versions of both 225th Street, which was my first book, and my uh, current, uh, or I should say my newest book, Nightmare in Holmes County. You can download those to to anything with a Kindle app being a laptop, a telephone, you know, whatever, computer, whatever, and you can get that uh, Kindle app for free. If you are a Kindle Prime member, you can read both books for free. You can also pick up a soft cover edition of 225th Street at patrickmeekin.com. And uh, I don't have soft cover editions of Nightmare in Holmes County just yet. It seems honestly, uh, more often than not, uh, the Kindle versions and the digital books are kind of where it's at right now. Yeah. I do having a paperback version of Nightmare in Holmes County available soon, though. All right. See, that's now, where I differ, yeah. though, because like I prefer a physical book compared to my Kindle. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think, in all honesty, I think it is kind of starting to go back that way. To be honest, right. um, I like a regular book. I just like a real book. You know, right? right. I mean, I oh, hate so. killing trees, but at the same time, I like <laughs> flipping through the pages. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh. and kind of my uh, my whole reason for doing what I do, um, just to kind of give a little bit of a back ground is um, I think I have a somewhat unique situation because I have lived in two consecutive yet unrelated haunted houses. A lot of people can live in a haunted house and what is there follows them to their next house. Um, that was not the case with me. Uh, 225th Street was actually the second house I lived in that was haunted, the second consecutive house. And uh, it was haunted long before I was even born. And uh, not only that, the first house, which is what I wrote about in Nightmare in Holmes County, uh, ended, I can say this much and not give away the book, it, it ended in a successful exorcism of the house and property. So I knew nothing followed me to 225th Street. Uh, however, when I got there, I you know, slowly had to come to the realization that it was also haunted. Mm-hmm. Now, there's like two questions I want to bring up right away now. But the very first one I'm going to go ahead and ask, just simply, before the Holmes County events had taken place, were you saved already? Did you already know yeah. Christ at that moment? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was a strong Christian even back then. Um, I got saved in my early 20s. And, you know, I honestly was raised in a Christian home. I always had faith, always, because that's what I was taught. You know, I was uh, raised on the King James Bible, it had it read to me when I was too little to read um, <laughs> almost every single night, you know, my mom would get us together in the living room, me and my brother and sister, and she'd read the Bible to us, and she would explain what it meant. And then as um, we got, you know, as each of us got old enough to read, um, we would read uh, passages as well, and, and then she would make sure we understood them. So I, I always had my faith. Uh, at 16 years old, uh, my father was murdered, and I think I went through a period where I never I never stopped believing what I knew to be 100% true, meaning my, the Bible. I knew it was true, mm-hmm. but I, I, I went through a, a period where I was in rebellion, and I, I think I had a chip on my shoulder, and I... Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it was a hard thing to, to, to go through losing my father that way. And uh, so I, I really, um, and in a lot of ways, you know, I didn't handle it the best. It's not like I went out and got on drugs or started, you know, uh, become an alcoholic or anything. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I, I had a chip on my shoulder. I did. I, I didn't like the way that whole situation went down. And I uh, I was not living a Christian life, even though I believed, you know. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, then uh, on Easter Sunday, um, I believe it was 1993, I went to church because it was Easter. <laughs> and uh, Pastor Terry Kidd at the uh, New Philadelphia Nazarene Church in Ohio uh, gave a very, very powerful altar call. And I tried my best to hold out and not go to the altar. I tried and I, and I couldn't. He kept holding it open he, and nobody was going to the altar. And he kept saying, the Holy Spirit is telling me there's somebody here. And he said, you know who you are and you need to get right with God. He said that, you know, and, and um, I couldn't hold out any longer. I mm-hmm. tried and I couldn't. And I went to the altar and, uh, you know, surrendered my life. As an adult, you know, I, right. I, I had done that as a teen, as a child and, you know, a teenager and things. But I, uh, I that was my first time as an adult. And uh, it was funny when I got done praying, I looked and the whole altar was full. So certainly <laughs> I was the first one to go. But certainly the Holy Spirit was telling the pastor that, uh, you know, there was somebody there. Right. <laughs> needed to get right with oh, God. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I was, you know, I, I always believed in the paranormal. I always believed in demons. I always I knew those things were true. Mm-hmm. Um, even growing up in church, you know, we had Uh-oh. Um, okay. all right. So, we're going to continue off with you had uh just went up to the the uh the altar and uh uh, we're getting saved again after uh, going back to the church. So um, mm-hmm. now one thing, Eric had one other question that kind of applies to the the whole, the house and homes colony and then moving to, to 220. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, <clears throat> now you had mentioned just a little while ago that the exorcism was successful in Holmes County. Mm-hmm. Now, according to Luke eleven twenty four, uh, Jesus tells us that when a demon is cast out, it travels amongst the world, it comes back to the place, and yeah. can, can find it, you know, swept up, clean, and goes grab seven demons more evil yeah. than itself. Yeah. Now, of course, if it's replaced with the Holy Spirit, it can't reside there. Right. I think a lot of people have a misconception that when a demon is cast out. It's pretty much out of the war completely. Yeah, yeah. They think that it goes to hell and that's where it's locked up, which isn't <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah, exactly. So with that said, you had mentioned that this haunting on 225th Street was completely different. It's completely separate. Mm-hmm. But is there any possibility that there was some sort of similarity in the fact that possibly, even though there was a current haunting there, the demons from Holmes County still could have traveled to 225th Street and added on to the previously haunted house that was already there and just, yeah. you know... Uh, 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 do you want to ask that like I, uh, as, as a full-on question? Because I have several answers to that. that are, uh, sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, they're very interesting because, yeah, that is true, and it can happen way later. It can happen years later. Right. Um, I still feel like I, uh, to this day, there are times I feel like I come under, especially since I wrote Nightmare in Holmes County, and since I really went full speed ahead finishing that book, I felt the exact same attacks mm-hmm. th- that I felt when I lived there. Absolutely. Okay. And, I, and I know that it's, it's to stop me. It's mm-hmm. to stop me from, fin- from sharing it, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, it from the, the technical difficulties that we're already having, I, I mean, I would, I could believe that it's, it's not just maybe even just one haunting, but more than, than one, uh, going on for you. So, uh, now you still reside in the 225th Street no, home? Nope. Okay. No. No. And and I'll tell you, <laughs> I think about all, all the future writing things I still have to share. <laughs> Those things go on. The stories go on, and they go on, and they go on. It's just that's just life, you know. Right. I have I found out things um, regarding 225th Street and regarding Nightmare in Holmes County that um, still um, that that activity. There are parts of those hauntings that still continue to the other people and um, even to, uh, you know, people that I know uh, very well that were in those houses or or spent some time in those houses. It does continue. We're in a war. And when that war is going to go on until basically uh, until we're in heaven, you know. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, that's just life, you know. Yeah. And I I completely agree with you, <laughs> and it it just seems like you've done uh, several interviews where you, you guys are constantly have, having these issues uh, w- with even recording. So, I mean, it's just it's weird to to see a, a haunting go beyond 
two homes and just continue and continue and continue. So it, it's just really interesting that mm-hmm. that you've gone through this. I think we're going to take our first break though, so that way we can we can uh, have Eric's random fact of the day, folks. You guys okay. are listening to Paratruth Radio. We will be right back in just a few minutes. Now, Eric's random fact of the day. Many people in the United States of America question whether or not the government keeps secrets from us. Well, perhaps it's not just the citizens who believe this. In fact, some presidents just may believe this too. Because according to factsides.com, John F. Kennedy, by far one of the most famous presidents in American history, secretly installed a taping system in the White House in 1962. This was Eric's random back to the day. All right, folks, welcome back to Para Truth Radio. My name's Justin. And I'm Eric. And uh, we've been talking to Patrick Meekin about uh, his two books, uh, 225th Street, which was the first book, and Nightmare in Holmes County, which is the second book. Uh, but uh, 225th Street was the the second haunting in in his life. And uh, we were just talking a little bit about uh, how some hauntings can can follow you, uh, whether you believe they're demonic, whether you believe they're human spirits. It's totally up to you guys. As we've said a hundred times, you know, it's whatever you believe it is. Um, but uh, we were talking a little bit during the break, and uh, Patrick has uh, filled us in a little bit on a couple of the other things that happened in Holmes County. And I, you know, one thing that uh, he had said is, is you know, his his mom had been afflicted years later after two twenty fifth Street had happened, and he was out of that home, and uh, he had uh, prayed. Over her, him and his siblings paid, prayed over her, and um, we'll we'll let you tell that story there, Patrick. Okay, in uh, in two twenty fifth Street, I do share about how you know um, what there was a point in time in that house. Uh, yeah, I just didn't like being there. You felt the oppression, you felt the demons when you pulled up in front of the house, especially as I was living there and not only having experiences, but. You know, I'm contacting all these people who had lived there some in some cases decades before me, and I'm hearing all their horrible stories and all their stories from these different families are all similar, even though they've never shared them with each other. You know, so that makes for a very uncomfortable environment to try to sleep and live in. Right. And, uh, so uh, my, a lot of times my mom would come in and stay with me and I, w- you know, she'd stay downstairs and sleep on the couch or whatever. But usually she didn't sleep a whole lot. And I share a lot of that in the book. But um on Mother's Day 2014, uh, me and my sister and my brother-in-law and my mother were all talking, and we were talking about 225th Street, and, and my mom said, you know, I always hated it when uh, I would be up praying and in the middle of the night, and I would start feeling air blowing on the side of my face, and you know, forgive me. I can't remember if she said it was the right side or the left side off the top of my head. I think it was the left side of her face. And she would always feel this air blowing on her face like something was just standing right there blowing on her. And it was very un- unnerving for her. And, but when she said that, my sister looks at her and her points her finger at her and says very uh, definitively, she says, that is the problem with your sinuses, and you need to renounce that right now. And as it turned out, after 225th Street and the time my mom spent in that house, she developed a horrible sinus problem. She had even been operated on, been to the doctor I don't know how many times, and this went on for years. It could not be fixed. They didn't know what was wrong. And even that day on Mother's Day, my mother's voice was very quiet, very hoarse. She even had trouble talking. And uh, because of this problem with her sinuses. Well, my sister says that she's convinced that all these problems came from whatever that was that would blow on the left side of my mom's face, which then, uh, you know, she felt affected her 
sinuses. So as it turned out, I said, I, I kind of thought to myself, yeah, sure, whatever. But I agreed, I will pray for you. So we anointed her with anointing oil and we prayed in agreement and very specifically went after anything that might be tormenting her from 225th Street. Mm-hmm. We prayed for her mm-hmm. and uh, I then left. And when I got into the next town where I could get signal on my phone, I called my mom while I was driving and she answers the phone and she's like, hello, her voice is completely normal. And I said, mom, your voice. And she said, I know. She said, I felt it while you were praying, but she said, it's gone. Whatever that was is gone. She has not had the problem anymore. So as a devout Christian, she's a very devout Christian and a prayer warrior. She was still afflicted by her time at 225th street. Okay. So that is the, the thing when you're dealing and you, these hauntings I experienced were demonic, no question about it. Mm-hmm. And these things will, they, they can still mess with you, you know, uh, even after you've moved on. And, and, and uh, during the break, they had ask ask me also, you know, you know, in the, in the book of Luke, it talks about when a demon's cast out, it will go through dry, arid places and return to its former home. And if it sees basically basically that its form, former home is empty and swept, it will take seven demons more evil than itself and go back in. So that the importance is we got to be filled with the Holy Spirit if, if we go through a deliverance. But um, certainly, I believe that I have felt uh, oppression different times since I've written these books and while writing them. Uh, linked to both of those houses. You know, I, I shared a lot of experiences when I was writing 225th Street. I was messed with a lot. The people that uh, proofread 225th Street were messed with while they read it. But there was a lot of things. Uh, even, you know, I went and got, I did very thorough research while writing 225th Street. And I, and I will share it. 225th Street was haunted. The, one of the main reasons was because in 1958, on March 1st, there was a suicide in the basement. And in my research, after I found out, you know, that that was what was causing the haunting, I uh, I went and got the death certificates of the guy who killed himself. I got news, I, uh, you know, I share in the book how it was like a mini miracle that I even found the newspaper article of his obituary. Even mm-hmm. I mean, the way that happened even was very strange. But I gathered my facts. And I gathered police reports. I, I mean, I did my homework because I knew people were going to call me a liar. And and uh, it's still to this day, people that don't like my faith will call me a liar and say, right. I mean, whatever. They don't care that I have the facts to prove what I'm saying. But regardless, um, when I was doing the research, I obtained the death certificate of the gentleman who killed himself. That same day, I also got a crash report from another gentleman who died in a mysterious accident while he lived in the house years later. And I got both of those reports. I put them in my home office and closed the door. Didn't think much of it. It was on a Friday. Saturday morning, I woke up. And I remember I woke up. It was very early. It wasn't time to get up yet. And I woke up and I thought, Oh, okay. I can, I can sleep a little while yet. So I shut my eyes. And when I shut my eyes, I heard it sounded like an old man's voice say, Patrick, like that. And I remember I opened my eyes and I thought I couldn't have dreamed that because I'm still awake, you know. But um, again, the, the, the gentleman who killed himself was almost, uh, he was nearing 70 years old with the, the, the gentleman who killed himself into 25th Street. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't believe that was him. I believe that was something that was haunting that house and was messing with me for sharing the truth about uh, what my experiences there were. Mm-hmm. But I, I could go on and on. I mean, I yeah, these things will mess with you. Um, and I... I talked one night to Chris Quarantino, who is actually used to be Christopher Lutz. He was uh, one of the real life children who lived in the Amityville Horror House. Mm-hmm. Okay, oh, okay. And we, me and him are friends, and we've we've spent some some late nights sharing stories with each other. And um, we were talking one night about you know these things continuing, and he said, "You know, Pat, he goes, uh, the, the, we're going to deal with this till the day we stand before the throne." He goes, because we're in a war. And I said, you know what? You're exactly right. And that's that's how I look at it now. It's life. I, I see that we are in a uh, we live in a spiritual realm and the spiritual realm is more real than the physical realm because it's eternal and the, the physical realm will pass away. Mm-hmm. Now, in regards to uh, Christopher, there is a if I'm not mistaken, there's a do- documentary out on Amityville. Is there not well, with him in it or no? 
That's his brother. That's his brother. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's Daniel. Daniel. That's right. Okay. I watched that. Uh. Oh, it's probably been two years now since I've watched that. But yeah, definitely that that in itself was an it was an interesting documentary. Um. And I know there's still a lot of question as to what had happened there was even real or if it was all in their mind or what was really going on. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the biggest cases in history that people just can't conclude, you know, was this truly a haunting of some sort or was it just, you know, some kind of psychotic breakdown in, in yeah. some way, you know, yeah. um, I, I, I totally believe it was real. <laughs> yeah. I've, I, I've experienced it. So, so I know, believe me. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, you know, Ed and Lorraine Warren, I, I, I think uh, I would have loved to have met Ed. Um, you know, they're, they're Catholic. I'm Protestant, whatever. There's a lot of things we still agree on and uh, different things that, that I've heard them share in videos and interviews over the years. And even as a child, I read part of the, their book, The Demonologist, and I mean part of it because I got so scared I didn't read the rest of it. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I uh, there's a lot of experiences that they share that I'm like, oh, my, the way they describe something that, they, that happened to them, I'm like, oh, my goodness, that is exactly, exactly what happened to me, you know? Right. And, and uh, so I'll give you an example. Um they had talked about this in the Amityville Horror House. They were going downstairs uh, they, and they were walking down the staircase. And Ed felt like just all of a sudden he felt like he was fighting against something like almost like he was fighting a current of water that he couldn't see. Mm hmm. And uh, when they said it that way, I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, there was a time in Holmes County that I was actually I mean, I was desperate. I was desperate for help. And I st I was sending an email to Bob Larson, who's a well-known exorcist. And uh, when I went to share one of the experiences that had recently happened in the house in this email, all of a sudden I felt an evil presence enter the room. I mean, you know, people talk, well, you just felt it, whatever. No, when you've been there, you know when you feel it. And, and right. when you get used to dealing with demons, you your discernment is is on high alert. And you know what you know when you're dealing with them. Mm -hmm. Me and Eric just brought that. Oh, up absolutely. And, and you know what? And I think. I'm sure you still there. Yeah. Pat, are you still there? Nope. You lost him. What the hell? Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, my God, man. <laughs> yeah. There was no warning for that one. No, it just it dropped both of us. Or did Eesh. you did you disconnect? No, I... What the I, heck? I don't know what happened. I mean, I, dr I lost both of you guys. So I wonder if all three of us lost each other. Did you even hear me say we talked about that last week? No. <laughs> I missed that because I actually was I I chimed in as soon as I thought he stopped talking for a moment. And so I chimed in to say something that was, you know, this weird similarity between these hauntings. And I was going to, you know, talk about uh, when that spirit said Patrick to him. Um, and I was going to respond about the time here at the house when right. me and my sister, both heard figure, stuff, yeah. you know, I was gonna be like, it's just just gonna go into some stuff with that. But. Cause we have to call him back. Um, go ahead, end the call, and then do it the same way we were doing. Okay, here we go. Ending. All right. Hello. Everybody there? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, we hear you. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm all sick for a, again for a few seconds. Well, the funny yeah. thing, think, Patrick, is yeah. is everybody lost signal. Like, yeah, it was, I lost uh, signal, too. He couldn't hear us, and then I was talking and couldn't hear you. Yeah. I could yeah. hear him, and then all of a sudden, the call was just gone, and then all of a sudden, without me even clicking an answer button, it came right back on, and it was yeah. calling you back, but it, me and Eric were together, so <laughs> it, it's it's not just what's going on on right. your end, either. Yeah, so, yeah. it's, it's well, interesting. It is interesting. You know, right before we lost contact, though, here, uh, and folks, for everyone listening, you know, you may notice that we are indeed losing contact here and there. And, and we are you know, leaving it in for a reason. And that yeah. reason is... So, you, uh, you know, is it spiritual warfare? Yeah, right. Exactly. Is it spiritual yeah. warfare? It could be. Is it just technical difficulties with no demonic influence whatsoever? There's a possibility. But the point is that these... Difficulties, these these problems that we have with the technology, especially when we're talking about topics on faith, about God, about Jesus, uh, about demonic influence and their 
basically their war strategies against the people of faith and against people in general. It is real. And the fact that for anyone who's listened to any of our shows in the past, especially since we've been on the new format, have we ever had any difficulties? No, we have not had one. No, but here we are with Patrick discussing spiritual warfare and suddenly we're having difficulties on air. And this happens Um, to him quite often. It happens all the time. It it does. And it's been this way ever since I started doing interviews for uh, when 225th Street came out. Wow. And now the one thing that you were discussing a little bit was uh, the similarities between hauntings and stuff. And it kind of sparked a memory of mine as well, because at one point you said you had kind of been sleeping, weren't really sleeping. You're pretty sure you're awake. I think for those of you out there, there is a point where, you know, you're almost asleep. But you're not completely asleep. You know, you're kind of in this weird zone. It's hard to explain. Dozing, so to speak. Yeah, in a sense. And you said that a spirit called out to you and just said, Patrick, like that. Yeah. Well, here in Cleveland, my sister and I had both witnessed something for months on end before we both realized that we were having the same, you know, issue when in that same state of sleep. And every single night when I was at that stage of sleep or whatever it is, you know, that in between stage, I would hear something call my name and it would do it in more of a whisper, but it would say, Eric, like that. Yeah. And so you had the same exact type of, I guess, force behind the, 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 uh, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the spirit is saying, even though mine is a whisper, yours is, was a little more loud. Yeah. It, it's just kind of showing the folks, even the heaviness, the thickness in the atmosphere. Why are these hauntings all so similar? Yeah. I mean, spirits, human spirits, they can't communicate to each other and play some kind of game on us. It has to be some kind of strategy against an enemy that is basically, you know, starting a war with us, that they're bringing a war to us. Absolutely. And they have a strategy and they're going to use it multiple times, especially if it's successful. Absolutely. And, you know, right before we were cut out there, I, again, I was trying to get help from uh, someone who was a, a well-known exorcist. Mm-hmm. And when I was typing that, I felt an evil, I felt evil come into the office with me. And I remember I was sitting there and I looked over my left shoulder very slowly. I really felt that I was going to see something standing there. Mm-hmm. I looked around. There was nothing there. I turned back. This is going to sound strange to people who have uh, spiritual discernment. You may understand what I'm saying um, with spiritual discernment. There are things that happen that, you know, in your spirit to be 100 percent accurate. And they are. But it's hard to verbalize them because sometimes spiritual things are hard to, de- you know, use the flesh to describe, you know. Yeah, right. But um, I, as I turned back around, I looked up and on my wall, I had a picture of the Last Supper. And I looked at Jesus's face. And it, this is the weirdest thing. When I looked at Jesus's face, I felt that like the Holy Spirit said to me, yeah, you're not alone. You are not alone. In other words, yes, there is something with you like you think there is, you know. I turned around. I stood up. I tried to walk out, out of the room. And it was exactly the way Ed Warren described it. I felt like I was walking against a heavy current of water. It was like it was almost like something was just an invisible hand was pushing my chest and trying to keep me from getting out of that room. My mm-hmm. legs felt like they weighed a ton. I mean, I could barely move. I was scared. Okay. Um, you know, there's a difference between, you know, the times when you are going to get in a fight and you know you're going to win. And then there's the times when you're going to get in a fight and you don't think you're going to win. This was <laughs> one of the I don't think I'm going to win. Yeah. And I had not done, you know, I had not got into doing exorcisms yet at that point. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 it caught me off guard. What was there made its presence felt. I was scared. And I went out and I picked up the phone to try to call my mom to ask her to pray. And, of course, I picked up the phone. And in those days, I had dial up Internet. So I hear, doodly, doodly, you know, the, the little, little God, boy. dial up internet. Like, That's going way back. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I got to go back in there and unhook the, or, you know, log off the internet. I don't want to go back in there, <laughs> but I did. And, um, it was the strangest thing though, you know, as things played out, what I started realizing was that, um, one of the experiences I was going to share with, uh, Bob Larson, as I was asking him to pray, was that someone with it was close to me was trying to help me in that house, uh, get ready for an open house. Cause I was trying to sell the house then. And uh, when they were there, they swore they heard somebody say their name in the foyer. 
and they looked around like, who said that? And they came, did you call me? No, I didn't call you. Well, I started to share. That's what I was starting to share with Bob Larson. Well, that person turned out to be someone who ended up needing deliverance also. And I believe they were being messed with on a different level in that house because of what was in the house as well. Mm-hmm. And I don't think what was there wanted me to tell Bob Larson what was actually going on. That's why I got messed with. But, um, as the as the situation in Holmes County progressed, and it went on for years, you know, I share a lot of of uh, very personal things and a lot of uh, you know things. I, I'm opening myself up to be called crazy or a liar or anything, mm-hmm. but I'm telling the truth. And uh, I was up against a, against a multifaceted demonic attack in Holmes County, and uh, it turned out there was something that was there. That was a, uh, you know, I've I've dealt with gatekeeper demons during exorcisms on people before, but it turned out there was a very similar kind of doorkeeper demon in that house. And um, I believe that was there because we built the house. It was the land that we built the house on was Mm -hmm. first. I didn't know that. And uh, so that demon was, I believe, there because of something that was already there when we came along, you know, and built a house. Uh, But, um, you know, you talk Mm -hmm. about. Yeah, there were attacks when, uh, you know, if it's just ghosts, why are the attacks like, um, for instance, why would a ghost want to attack me just because I was going to tell Bob Larson that somebody heard their name called out in the house, you know, right. or um, one night when you live in that environment, you know, I don't ever want to I don't ever want to know what hell's like. I would not care to have a Bill Weiss experience like, you know, the gentleman who wrote <laughs> 23 minutes in hell. But right. I can tell you this. I've interviewed people on, you know, my own blog talk show before who have uh, had after uh, death experiences of being in hell. And some of the things they describe, I will say this in an earthly sense. When you're in a very demonically uh, possessed area, you will have the same types of things happen as what happens in hell to a person in hell. It's just not as extreme as hell, you know, because you're there in an environment with things that hate you. And they want to destroy you and they want you to kill yourself. If they can't kill you because God's protecting you, uh, you know, at least limiting what they can do, they'll try to drive you to do it yourself. And, um, you know, there were times and I, 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 I'm very transparent in Nightmare in Holmes County and that's, that's hard to do, but you know, I share my weaknesses and that, you know, I wasn't, even though I had gotten into doing deliverance ministry during that time, I wasn't, uh, you know, totally uh, faithful or how would you say it my, like my faith wasn't as strong as it needed to be every day right, right. because I was being oppressed and there were times where I would just I would turn on God and start questioning God instead of realizing okay you need to just start binding demons and fight them not God you know mm-hmm. yeah. well, but, um, again goes back to Job same exact thing exactly, happened exactly oh in fact since you said that there was a there was a day in it, in my time in, in Holmes County and I share this in the book I woke up one day and I was having a uh, the discussion with God about how bad things were. And I said, uh, why would you, I said, why would you even let me be born to, to, to suffer like this? Why, why that's cruel. Why would you even let me be born? I wish I would have never even been born. And then I was belly aching and I said, you know, at least let me die. Let there be an accident. Let something happen where I die. Cause I'm not going to kill myself, but let me just die. And let me, let, let my death count for some, for good for somebody else. And I meant it. That's how bad right. off I was. Okay, right. so later that day I pick up my Bible and I'm flipping through it, and I in, in the uh, in my King James Bible when you open it up and you start going through Job, I don't know what chapters it is off the top of my head, but at the top of each page it says what's on that page, what 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 is covered, mm-hmm. and at the top of one page it said uh, Job longs for death. And the top of the next page, it said something to the effect of um, Job curses the day he was born or something like that. And I, when I saw that, I thought, OK, um, I get it. You know, even Job, whose faith is greater than mine, went through what I went through. Right. So, Absolutely. It, 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 uh, you know, so but, but when I say that um, there was another time when I was uh, this was getting close to me finding out what was causing the haunting in 2009. I finally, you know, we, we did an exorcism late in 2009 and um, not long before I found out the whole secret. Um, I was bottoming out again, driving home. And, you know, as I thought back later, I realized you could even drive from Tuscarawas County, cross through Stark County and into Holmes County. And I never put it together till I was really far along into that experience that you actually felt the oppression start when you crossed, crossed into Holmes County. 
and so, I um, I was having a discussion with God, and I said, you know what, I, I can't take this anymore. I've, I've been praying for years. This has gone on for years, and you're not answering my prayers. I give up. If you want, if you want to help me, that's your business, but I'm not believing anything anymore. I'm done. I don't care anymore, and I, that's what I said. And I walked in my door of my house, and I uh, walked through the foyer, turned off my security system, walked back through the foyer. So I'm walking straight towards the front door. I turn and go up the stairs, go in and check the answering machine in my bedroom upstairs. As I come back out of my bedroom and I look down into the foyer, the on each side of the door, of the front door, there was, there was vertical windows. You know, so there's a steel mm-hmm. frame around the vertical windows and a steel door. And I had put up uh, curtains over those um, vertical windows that had magnetic curtain rods at the top and bottom of the window. And then the curtains actually had magnets sewn into the sides of them. So you couldn't stand outside and look in the house. Because I, I got to where I didn't trust the people I lived around too much. So, right. Um, I, come, I go to come down the stairs. And the top magnetic curtain rod, which was taller than me, and I'm six foot four, was turned at an odd angle it had been manipulated and it was the the curtain rod itself was pulled apart and it was just hanging there and the magnet that holds it to the steel window wasn't even over the steel anymore it was over the wood strip between the steel frame of the window and the steel door that's impossible unless something pulled it off of the steel frame of the window spread it apart and then stuck it there it, it can't happen otherwise Right, right. And uh, so needless to say, I was repenting very quickly. I was scared because that had happened another time. And it happened when a pastor came and said he would pray for me. And, and uh, w- the same same thing happened then, you know. So um, I knew, OK, I, I am in no condition here to be doubting God. I'm in a I'm in a fight and I can't win it by myself. I, I got it. You know, and I'm saying, God, I am sorry. I, 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 I repent. Forgive me for the unbelief and all these things, you know. But um there were, you know, you, you would see sometimes when you really gave up, things would start happening worse after you gave up because, you know, you're taking any protection you have away when you're telling God back off. I don't want you in my life. And, you know, he'll listen to a point, you know, mm-hmm. he lets us Absolutely. use our free will. But um, I had many experiences um, in that house uh, that are just they're terrifying. They were horrible when I went through them. Uh, now. After what I've been through now, stuff doesn't scare me. Like, you know, I talked about that night when my heart, you know, I I felt like I was going to have a heart attack and I couldn't walk out of the office to go call. Right. Like, I don't have those types of experiences now. Stuff happens, um, especially doing deliverance ministry. There are times I get messed with even where I live now. But uh, I, I take the fight back to the enemy. You know, yeah, it might startle me and it might scare me at first. But then it's like, OK, I'm, I'm going to fight. Right. And absolutely. And and here's the one thing I always tell people. I don't fight in my name. I don't fight in my strength or my say so. I fight in Jesus name using the power of the word of God, you know, and and, uh, when you do that, you're going to win. It's that simple. So, um, you know, going through those experiences, I never would have chose to go through the things that I share in either one of those books. I would have never chose either of those experiences. But, you know, the Bible says that what the devil means for good, for what the devil means for bad or for evil, God will use for good. And that is what has happened. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I completely agree. And there are a number of things that happened to me before I became saved. And, uh, you know, I. It's just a lot of things that really, sh- I guess, show you who God is and how he works and what he does to bring you to faith. But before I get into that, I'll discuss it more later after we take a quick break and listen to Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Hey, pair fans. Justin here with your paranormal headlines. These headlines are from unexplainedmysteries.com. NASA announces discovery of a second Earth. Astronomers using the Kepler telescope have found the most Earth like extrasolar planet ever discovered. Kepler 452b is thought to be a rocky terrestrial world with an orbit very similar to our own around a star that is also very similar to our own. 
Out of more than 1,000 extrasolar planets identified to date, this particular world is being hailed as the most significant and Earth-like of them all. Kepler-452 has similar characteristics to our Sun, which makes finding a planet with an orbital period similar to Earth in this system very exciting, said Daniel Huber of the University of Sydney. It is the first time we have found such a planet. The discovery was outlined at a NASA press conference earlier today with scientists indicating that standing on its surface could potentially feel a lot like home. That is not to say that Kepler-452b is exactly like the Earth, however. It is approximately 60% larger than our own planet, and one year there would be 485 days long. It is also a very long way away at a distance of 1,400 light years in the constellation Cygnus. Nonetheless, its remarkably Earth-like orbital distance places it right in its star's habitable zone, and scientists believe that it has been there for 6 billion years, enough time for life to have developed. It is currently unknown whether or not the planet has an atmosphere or if there really is life there, but is likely to be a prime target for future observation once telescopes become powerful enough. New Mountain Range Revealed on Pluto New images from the New Horizon probe have revealed another vast region of mountains on Pluto's surface. It has only been a few days since the first high-resolution photographs of Pluto were returned by the spacecraft, and already much has been revealed about what lies on this distant icy world. Earlier images of mountains comparable in height to the Rockies here on Earth have been joined by further pictures showing a separate chain of peaks similar in size to the Appalachian Mountains. These remarkable geological features span the edge of Pluto's distinctive heart, which has since turned out to be broken up into several different regions with varying textures and reflectivity. Scientists are still working to determine the processes responsible for the stark transition between the dark crater-marked region on one side and the smooth frozen plains on the other. There is a pronounced difference in texture between the younger frozen plains to the east and the dark, heavily cratered terrain to the west, said New Horizons geophysicist Jeff Moore. There is a complex interaction going on between the bright and dark materials that we're still trying to understand. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. My name is Eric. I'm Justin. And you are listening to Paratruth Radio. We are speaking with Patrick McCann. And before we went to break... I like how you did the whole... Yeah, you like that? (laughs) You like that? Uh, (laughs) We were speaking with Patrick McCann. And uh, before we went to break... Patrick was discussing a number of different things in regards to the hauntings that he has experienced. And I had mentioned that I had gone through some very similar things and said I would mention a couple of those things. And, you know, one in particular is my my sisters and I have always, not have always, but had grown up in a house that was haunted. Now, our parents had told us it wasn't. uh, They believed that we were just, you know, being children, basically, because we were. Uh, however, as time went on, and in particular year 2000, something happened that disturbed not only me and my sisters, but also my cousins. And of course, my mom and uh, my uncle, her brother, who grew up in the house, finally came clean and said, yeah, we remember the house being haunted when we grew up as well. And since then, a lot of things have happened to me in particular. Uh, and one in particular was moving to the new house after so many, a couple of years of living here, I went through 
three months of demonic affliction where, you know, I would see these giant black masses and things would touch me. Things would growl. Uh, I would witness myself in dreams like nightmares. I'd witness myself uh, killing myself, if you will, in hell. I, I've I've had nightmares of me having to cut my uh, stomach open and pull out my own organs uh, one by one in order to save my sisters from uh, some other type of torment. Uh, there, there have been a number of different things. And let me tell you, his nightmares were, were not pretty. He shared pretty much every single one with me and he could make horror stories for the rest of his life and still have plenty more to go. <laughs> uh, but the one thing that's interesting is, you, you know, as Patrick had said a little bit earlier, Sometimes, you know, people have experienced hell and sometimes what happens in hell is also experienced here on Earth, just in a much uh, lesser or lighter fashion. And cutting yourself open and pulling out your own organs is pretty hellish, if you ask me. And it was something that really, you know, scared the crap out of me at the time. However, as Patrick was saying, you know, there comes a time where you're really scared of these things. But as time goes on, you start to to uh, witness more of it and even start to fight back. This fear kind of disappears. And I was actually having a conversation with a friend of mine earlier today who was discussing or telling me about a possible demonic possession or oppression. And she didn't quite know. She, you know, she's she's just really freaked out about it, about the things that she's heard and the things that she's witnessed. And uh I had told her, I was like, you know, honestly, if if things get worse, give me a call. I'll come by and, you know, we'll cast this thing out. And she's like, you know, aren't you scared of that type of thing? And of course, in her eyes, you know, I'm looking at her in the eyes and she's just dreading everything she's saying. She's, she's fearful of it. And I'm like, you know, I've been in this, you know, not business, but I've been in this uh, <laughs> fight for a long time. Uh, you know, I've cast demons out in the past, uh, in particular through prayer. And I shared a story with her. I, I have friends that have been through this. You know, this is something that God has brought to me, you know, and he's used it for good. And so, you know, do I do I get a little, little uh, uncomfortable at times around demons? Do I get uncomfortable when they attack? Yeah, I, I get startled at times, just like Patrick. You know, he gets startled, too. But you know what? There's something so much greater beyond the demons that we fight. There is someone so much stronger beyond the devil that leads those demons. And his name is Jesus. And because of him, both I, Patrick, Justin, others out there that are fighting the good fight are capable of moving on. Even when we're startled, even when we feel like we're stuck in the corner, it allows us to, you know, you ever back an animal into a corner and the animal doesn't want to be there? Yeah. It's kind of the same thing, you know? When a demon backs a Christian who is meant to fight this fight, this battle against demons, you get back to a certain corner and you have nothing else but to fight. You don't give up. Yeah. And I just want to you know, tell everyone out there who is witnessing something like this, who who ne- doesn't necessarily know how to fight, but you're scared of anything that you're witnessing, anything that is attacking you. Don't be. Don't be afraid. That's what they want. Yeah. Turn to God. Pray. Ask for his help. And he will come to your help. Uh, and of course, if you guys got, if anyone out there has questions, you guys need help, external help, you know, for, beside yourself, beside turning to God, you want someone to talk to, someone who can help you uh, discern and understand what's going on, feel free to email me. You can email me at paratruthradio at gmail.com. Let me know what's going on, and I'd be more than happy to talk to you. And I believe Patrick would do the same thing. Absolutely. So you can contact him as well. But, you know, we're coming close to, to the end of the show. I, I do want to get through a couple of more questions. Uh-oh. Hello? I think we lost him. Ah. <laughs> Let's see if he yeah. comes back. If not, then uh, we'll we'll tell him to call us back like we've been doing. Okay. I think it looks like the call's coming in, I think, right now. Uh, it's, I'm not sh- Oh, it's yeah, it's showing it's trying to call him. Eric, it hello, is. hello. Yeah, I'm here. Wow. Right. Hello. <laughs> yeah. I don't Dude, know, what Patrick. Just you, there. you were not kidding, man. <laughs> no, it, it, it's that's life. That's life now. You know, and I, I, I want to share this real quick. Um, yeah. Be, uh, I, I have so many more things to write. You know, it's hard to find the time and everything. But um, you know, 
one one of the stories I, I'm going to write about is uh, one of the first cases of full on exorcism that I did myself, and um, I remember this an individual that I know. Uh, my mother had actually cast a demon out of this individual. And uh, I said, what was it like to my mom? I said, what was it like? And she said, oh, Patrick, the Holy Spirit comes over you and you are not scared. You, She said, you feel the Holy Spirit like you cannot believe. And uh, shortly thereafter, it came time to basically go after the other the other spirits that this person had and it was exactly no no i had stated how scared i was when that thing made its appearance in my office in my home my home office you know in holmes county um the exact opposite of that L- later um i was contacted to get to hurry to a location um i had to drive a little ways to get to a location to uh help with an exorcism on that individual because they there was multiple spirits there and um it was the it was exactly the way my mom described it. I felt the Holy Spirit like I mean it's go time. It's time to fight, and I'm not backing down. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm going to win in Jesus' name. You know, mm-hmm. it's hard to even describe it. And um, I had all all the hair. I remember I got the call. All the hair on my arms was standing straight up in the air, but it wasn't out of fear. It was out of it's go time. You know, and I grabbed my Bible and and took off. And um, when I had this is when my, one of my first cases uh, of actually done an exorcism, like I said, and um, when I walked in, I had known God showed me beforehand and I had told my mom, I said, I know what this person has and I know the number six is significant, but I don't even know what that means. I said, I know what they got, and I know the number six is significant. So I go, I go walk in. I walk in on this person sitting in a chair. Their face is all contorted. My mom's holding a Bible against this individual saying, tell me your name. And this thing is all these weird voices coming out. The person's face is all contorted. And I walked in, and again, I had never done an exorcism yet. And I walked in, and I said, I know who you are, Jezebel, and you're leaving today. This thing turns its head and starts screaming, how did you know? How did you know? I said, God told me, you're leaving. And uh, the interesting part, that, that, that's just the exact opposite of the fearful, the devil hits you, you're not expecting it, and you're sc- literally scared to death. This is the exact opposite of that. This is, I, it's hard to describe unless you've, you've been through it, but when the Holy Spirit comes on you like that, you you know you you're not going to lose you know and the interesting part was yeah one of the worst demons this individual had was a Jezebel spirit and guess what it had come in six generations earlier in the bloodline it was there because of something an ancestor six generations now how could i have known that and i had told my mom i knew i know number 6 is significant and i know what it, what this thing's name is and and i was right and that is because the holy spirit god gives every one of us gifts um, I've even heard Howard Pittman say this. If you've ever listened to any of Howard Pittman's things, he is very, very wise on spiritual warfare and the de- demonic realm. And uh, uh, Howard Pittman said even, and I found this to be true, people who are called to deliverance ministry. In other words, that's where God has called you. He will usually give you a gift of discernment. And the reason why with discernment, you know, things you have no way of knowing them and they're true. And the reason God does that is it gives you the upper hand with the demons. It gives you the upper hand because you know their little secrets that they hide behind to try to stay in the person, you know, or to try to stay in the house. So I want to share that, though, because the the, the thing is, these, yeah, these aren't things to play with. You know, I see people like on Ghost Hunters or different shows, Ghost Adventures, whatever, I've seen them, and they'll go in to provoke a demon. They're not Christians, and they'll say, in Jesus' name, I tell you to do this. That's dangerous, because mm-hmm. they know if you're saved or if you're not, and and the Bible talks about that. The seven sons of Sceva did that, and they were not saved, and they, 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 they commanded this demon that was in one, this guy had a demon in him, and, and, and the seven sons of Sceva commanded the demon in Jesus' name, and the demon looked at them and said, I know Jesus, and I, and they said, we command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, the apostle Paul preaches, mm-hmm. and the demon said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? And it beat one guy with a demon and he beat up seven of them, seven men and sent them, you know, scurrying away wounded, you know, so these aren't things to play with, but they are things to defeat. And that is only going to come through that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and, uh, I, you know, like, like I said, I could go on and on. There's many stories in, in both books, many things that I, you know, haven't shared that are, if you want something that's, 
kind of entertaining because it is creepy. It's there because I I share exactly and and nothing I'm sharing in those books has been sensationalized. I say it how it happened. But along with those stories in both books, I make it very, very clear how in detail how to have authority over demonic spirits, why they come in, what allows them to come in in the first place, how to deal with them. Um, you know, and, and what what are our weapons of warfare? You know, mm-hmm. and, and the Bible, the Bible talks about that. We have weapons of warfare. So, number one, we are in a war. You know, the church doesn't talk about it, but I don't care. We are in a war and right. we do have weapons. And I cover that in both books in detail. OK, what are those weapons? How do I understand the demonic realm so I know where to attack the enemy if I need to? You know, and I share that in there because, you know. I do believe both of those books, I didn't write them to, you know, be the next Amityville horror author or something like that. I wrote them because I I know that I experienced those horrible uh, situations to learn spiritual warfare according to the Bible and to share it with others. So when they go through what I went through, they know how to win. And uh, again, that's why this show gets attacked tonight. That's why <laughs> technical difficulties. You know, I've had that on secular programs I've been interviewed on. They, they had weird things happen. I had weird things happen. Um, you know, but that's life. You know, we are yeah. in a war and the war has already been won, but the, the uh, roles have not been enforced yet. Jesus already won the victory. All the roles of that victory are going to be enforced in the end. But right now we're in that time period uh, in the, it, where souls are in, hanging in the balance to be hopefully saved. If not saved, they will be condemned to hell. There's only mm-hmm. two places. So we're in this time here to try to, you know, live the best life we can live according to God and try to help those along the way who need it. Absolutely. Uh, Patrick, I think we're, we're actually we are. We're pretty much out of time here. First and foremost, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, these books are absolutely filled with a ton of information, guys. If you want to hear Patrick's story, uh, I got to tell you, like it, it almost seems like this is the movie. You know, yeah. it almost seems unreal. Yeah. Uh, but Patrick, I'd like to give you the chance uh, a second time here to tell everyone where they can find you or th- where they can get your book. Uh, so I'm going to give it to you. Thank you. Again, uh, my name is Patrick Meekin. That's spelled M-E-E-C-H-A-N. And you can find me on my website at uh, patrickmeekin.com. There are links there, uh, or you can just go to Amazon and you can download uh, Kindle versions of both 225th Street and Nightmare in Holmes County. Um, if you're a Kindle Prime member, you can read them both for free. If you would like a soft cover edition of 225th Street, and it is the second edition of 225th Street. I've updated it with a little bit more information than what was in the first book. Um, you can pick that up at patrickmeekin.com as well. Cool. Awesome. If you want to contact me, you can contact me through the website as well. I am also on Facebook. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, Patrick, for being on. It was awesome talking with you. I was looking forward to this uh, conversation for a while now. Yeah. Me too, and, and I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity, and I find your stories fascinating as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, hopefully we can have you on again sometime yeah. in the future, especially when you uh, end up writing the, the new book that right. you were just telling us about. Yeah. So uh, until then. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. All right. All right, let's finish this up. Let's rock this body. All right, folks. That was Patrick Meekin. Uh, he has authored two books, 225th Street, as well as Nightmare in Holmes County. I encourage you guys to check his stories out. He's definitely got a, a huge story to tell and obviously is not done telling it. So uh, definitely check that out. Absolutely. Now, folks, of course, as you know, there does come a point in the show in which we go into scripture time. (laughs) Uh, And, of course, you know, I I don't think I need to go as in-depth tonight, mostly because this is already going to covering kind of the stuff that we've already covered with Patrick. But I, I do think it's important, especially the end here. So, folks, demons are out to destroy. They're out to kill, to steal, to destroy. That's what Satan does. And he drives his army, his mass, a demonic army, to do the same thing. That's the game. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> That's the game plan. The end game plan is to take over the throne of God, which will never happen as we see in the book of Revelation. And of course, Satan, deep down, he knows this already, but he's so prideful, he ignores it. And he tries to overtake the throne of God and Jesus casts him out. You know, Jesus chains him, chains him down, throws him into the burning like a sulfur in the end. And the, the devil is defeated forever and ever. <laughs> okay. Could you imagine if Jesus was Dude. a Mortal Kombat? Oh, he'd kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, continue on. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbit trail. Uh, yeah, I'll say. <laughs> During scripture time. <laughs> I know. Jeez. <laughs> Shame on you, Justin. <laughs> so, folks, you know, spiritual warfare, it's a real thing. For the, for those of you who are Christian, you know this. For those of you who are not, you just heard it for the first time right now. And maybe it's not the first time. Maybe you've heard it before, but this is real, this is real stuff. Everything you just heard Patrick tell us is legit. These things really happen to him. Everything you heard uh, from my story it's legit. It's really happened. Uh, Justin knows it. He's been around for all of it. Things that Justin has witnessed, it's true. It's yeah. all happened. Well, look uh, at the just look at the recording, guys. I mean, the, the recording doesn't lie. Is it possible there? It's just technological glitches. Absolutely. Uh, but just trying to get through this particular uh, episode has been painstaking, to say mm-hmm. the least. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now with that said, I just I got to say, you know, uh, for, especially for the Christians, for my fellow brothers and sisters out there, you know, it, there is the war. There's a spiritual war going on right now for your soul. Uh, it's good versus evil. God versus Satan. Someone's going to win. Now, if you've committed your life to Christ, if you fully believe that he died and rose for you and that your sins are completely forgiven and that Jesus currently sits on the throne and he's waiting for you, waiting for the day that he gets to see you again in heaven or comes here to you and puts the world to an end to bring about his new kingdom. You know, then you're saved. You have nothing to worry about. Satan, no matter what he does, cannot get to you because your salvation is secure. However, I put a word of warning out to those who are not saved, for those who do not believe in Jesus, because that war, the same war that Christians are fighting, is the same war you're fighting. You just don't know it. And I know I'm being very harsh here. I know I'm coming straight out, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Coat it. it. This can't be sugarcoated. You need to hear the truth. And it's what I truly, with all my heart, believe is the truth. Satan is out to win your soul. If you do not turn to Christ, you do not accept him as your Lord and Savior, you do go to hell. It's very clear in the Bible. It's point on. There is no, there is no such thing as purgatory. There is no, you know, walking the earth after you're dead. There is no second chance. There is no, you know, make your own decisions. There's no free will after you die. When you die, you die. You go to heaven or to hell, based on your belief. Mark sixteen seventeen says, "These signs will accompany those who believe." And this is believe in Jesus Christ. In my name, they will drive out demons. With this warfare, if you have witnessed something, for those of you who who aren't saved and you're seeing things, you're witnessing true demonic activity, or you think it's just, you know, human spirits walking around you. You're, it's your grandfather, your grandmother, or, you know, whoever, your ancestors. It's not. It really isn't. And in time, you'll see that they're not, because eventually they will turn on you. They will show you who they really are. You cannot cast out these demons on your own. You need to believe in Christ in order to do it. You need to have the Holy Spirit within you in order to cast out demons. For those of you who are Christian and witnessing the same things, you have the power. You have the authority to drive out demons according to Mark 3.15. 
Now, not everyone is called to do the stuff that I do, to do the stuff that Patrick does, to do the stuff that Justin does. You know, we, we come on the radio every week and we do this. We work in the paranormal community. And by work, I mean that we freely work because we don't get paid for this, guys. Yeah. This isn't a job. This is not a job. This is one. It's what we like to do. We like helping people. We like discussing these things, finding the truth. That's why we debate. You know, it's not for our own benefit. What I believe stands. What Justin believes, well, that would be an argument sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, you but know, it's we, not so much an argument as a debate. It is. Yeah. Well, absolutely. You know what I mean, though? You know, the point is we debate these things for the benefit of you guys. So you can see both sides and truly learn what the truth is. And I hope that everyone com- that listens comes to the saving knowledge, to the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. There is something very important. This is a huge warning for everybody, whether you're saved or not saved. This is a huge warning because many people out there truly believe they're Christian. They do. They believe they're Christian, and yet they're not living the Christian life. They're not turning away from their sins. They're not repenting. They're not, you know, going out and working for God. They're not in ministry of any sort whatsoever. They just go to work. They come home. They sit on their couch, and that's it. They don't have a radio show. They don't have a a church group to go hang out with. They don't have, uh, you know, somewhere where they can go and lead people in the way that God wants them to lead people. You know, God told us, Christ told us that we have to go out and make disciples. We have to lead people to Christ. And not everyone out there is Christian. For the longest time, I, I grew up Roman Catholic. I believed I was saved. I believed that when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's what I believed as a Roman Catholic. I'll tell you what. If I died at any time before September of 2009, I would not be in heaven. I wouldn't because I had a false understanding of who God is, of who Jesus is. I believed I was Christian, but I wasn't. And Jesus clearly warns us in Matthew 7.22, He says, many will say to me on that day, being the day that we go to heaven, the day that we come before the presence of God. I want to clarify that in particular. He says, Lord, Lord. Many people will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Verse 23 says, and then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, or depart from me, you evildoers. The point here is not everyone who claims to be Christian, not everyone who believes Jesus is God, truly believes that he's God. Not everyone who says they're Christian truly understands what the scripture tells us. They don't follow it. They don't believe Jesus is truly what the Bible says he is. They think he's just a prophet. You you, you think uh, that because you you know Jesus, you can get away with any sin you want because he's merciful. That's not the case. He wants you to repent. repent. You need to repent. The more you sin, the more you drive out the Holy Spirit. And Jesus clearly warns us that if we do not fully accept Christ and follow every command that he gives us on the day that we die. And we're hoping and begging God, Lord, please, I did all these things because of you. Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I do this and I do that? And Jesus will look into your heart and then look at you and say, no, you didn't. You didn't do it for me. You never knew me. I never knew you. And then that's the end. Hell opens up. It's important, you know, you can say you know Jesus, but the question is, does Jesus know you? And the way you know that for sure is if you truly believe that he died and rose again for your for your sins. You truly believe that he is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. He is God, the creator of all things. He is the one who controls everything. He sits on the throne right now, waiting for the day that he can come back waiting for the day that he can bring us home 
He wants everyone to come to heaven with Him. He wants everyone to live in eternity with Him. But not everyone will. And so with that said, I just wanted to put those few verses out there to remind you, you know, do not be afraid of Satan. Don't be afraid of him. If you are, turn to someone. Turn to your church. If, you, if your church can truly help you, turn to them. Not every church, I'll tell you now, not every church will be willing to help. They won't. Some Many churches out there, they deny the existence of Satan. But you can always turn to God. God is always there. He's willing to open his ears if you repent and ask him for forgiveness. He will help you. Also, if you need it, you know, if you want any help from from a, a person, you know, someone other than, uh, or I guess someone who who you can have some kind of uh, reliability, someone who can just talk to you with things, uh, someone who can uh, share their experiences, you know, and the same things. You can email me. You can email Justin and I, you know, whoever you want to talk to. Yep. Um, you know, let let me know. Paratruthradio at gmail dot com. Our email is always open. We check it every single day. We're willing to talk. We want to talk with you. I've been through these things. I've been probably pretty much where everyone else has been who's listening right now. I've been up. I've been down. I've been, you know, I've believed that I was saved when I wasn't. I've become saved and I still struggle with with demons sometimes. It's just the way it is. But you're not alone. You're not alone. I'm here other Christians are around, ready, willing to talk. But most importantly, Jesus Christ is there. He sees everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. He's just waiting for you to call on him. That's all I got. All right. Actually, I have one piece of scripture myself. Well, okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> By the power of grace, God. Okay, it wasn't really scripture, but but it goes yeah. along the same lines yeah. as Eric is saying. <laughs> um, so, with that being said, that's all we got for you guys tonight as far as topic. A uh, few quick announcements for you. Uh, as we've been saying for the past couple of weeks, we do have a new logo coming up. It is complete. Uh, I believe we are debuting it, not this show, but next show, correct? Um, of what August. Is that? August 2nd. Yeah. So August sense, and yeah. So next show, you guys will see a new logo. So you guys will see some new stuff come, going on here at Paratruth Radio. Uh, also, too, like we again have been saying for the past couple of weeks now, uh, we are going to Scarefest. Stay tuned for that. It is Absolutely. coming up like super fast. <laughs> so uh, we will be doing a live broadcast there Friday evening, I believe, so that uh, you guys can see all the, or hear all the great stuff that's going to be going on there. Uh, if you do come, uh, as I said last week, if you guys are Christian, be forewarned. There are things there that, that do not agree with Christianity. So if you feel that you can't handle those, those dark things that are there, please don't come. I mean, I don't want you guys to go just because, you know, we're going to be there or some paranormal celebrity is going to be there. Absolutely. Uh, have, have discernment guys have discernment. Yeah. It's not for everybody. So, uh, but if you are there, we'll be broadcasting live telling you where we're at at any particular moment. You guys are more than welcome to, uh, approach us. We will have our shirts on for you guys to find us. If you don't know our faces, even though we, plaster them all over the place uh <laughs> we will we will have those at least on uh so you can can find us um, absolutely and then uh eric definitely has a another update for the revealed yep, as well absolutely i do uh i, I know I'm, I'm giving a lot of updates lately on the revealed folks uh, <laughs> reason being we are getting very close to production time that's only what like august Two months. Yeah. It's like two months away, guys, that yeah. we start filming. But this is a very important update. And it's, it's not so much an update necessarily as it is just uh, a thank you. And I want to give a, because I want to give a very special thank you to Heidi Linden of Talk Supernatural. Uh, she's one of our good friends uh, here in the paranormal community. Uh, her and her husband, we, we've talked to them a lot. Uh, we actually have a show coming up in October with them. Uh, and uh, August. Actually, yeah, August. And August, August, yes, forgive me. We have one coming up like like soon, guys. Yeah. 
like really soon in two um, weeks actually a matter of fact like, like whoa yeah <laughs> yeah just that so uh you know you definitely going to check us out on that i would hope um if not you should at least check it out for them because they're awesome yeah uh, not yeah, as cool yeah. as us <laughs> sorry scott it's just not gonna happen uh, um but you know you guys are kind of cool. <laughs> we'll get some plaque for that, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that was actually one of the questions I was going to ask them. You know, like <laughs> one of the questions I was going to ask because I, I forgot all about it, unfortunately. But I was going to ask them, like, hey, um, when are you guys going to become as cool as Pear Truth Radio? <laughs> I well, missed out on that opportunity. Maybe they'll answer it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes. Heidi Linden of Talk Supernatural, uh, she donated to The Revealed um, to help me out with actually producing the film. I do need money to do it. She donated. And I'll tell you what, she was the first person, first ever, to donate to The Revealed. So, again, special thank you, Heidi. Thank you so much. I know I sent you an email already, but I wanted to throw it out there so everyone can hear it. Um, It's... Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, folks, again, if you're interested, you want to know more about my movie, The Revealed, you can check it out at paratruthradio.com. It's the synopsis. Just click on the Creative Works tab and it'll tell you there's a synopsis of what the movie's about, basically. If you want to know more and you're even interested, maybe, in donating, which would be wonderful, you can go ahead and click on the GoFundMe tab at the bottom of the Creative Works page, uh, and it'll take you to the GoFundMe website where, again, I have even more information on the movie. Uh, and, of course, there's a number of different perks that you can that you can gain if you were to give a certain amount of money. Now, by no means do you have to follow those perks. You know, I think I have $5, $25, $50, so on and so forth. If you can only give $1 and you're willing to give $1, you have no idea how much you blessed me by giving me a dollar. Uh, and of course, by me, I mean you're giving it to my entire crew because I am paying for uh, for food and drinks for 10 days of shooting. I am paying for uh, props for the film. I'm paying for my actor to be flied out from L.A. There's a lot that goes into this, guys, a lot. I'm paying for fuel to get from one uh, location to the next. There's a lot that goes into this, guys, and I can really use the help. This is a, a movie for school. It is a thesis project. It's my senior thesis project. I've only got one more year left in school, guys. Um, so yay to me. I never thought yay. I'd make it this far. Never thought I'd make it this far. I didn't. I didn't. 29 well, years old and about to graduate. You did with go back and forth. You know. I did. So, I mean, and as I told you, ministry, you can do ministry through movies. So Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yeah, so guys, uh, this is a senior, senior thesis film, but I do have every intention of, um, I guess, entering it into film festivals around the country. So definitely a big, awesome deal for me that I'm really hoping to achieve. Um, it's a dream. It really is a dream. So I hope you guys can make this even more awesome and support me, become a part of this film. It would be wonderful. Everyone who donates becomes a part of this film. So I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm going to shut up. I know I have to go on and on and on about this. Uh, but thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you to everyone who's listening. Uh, just please keep it in your prayers. Absolutely. And on that note, I think we're done. Yay. Yeah. Woo, it was a good episode, guys. Every episode is good, of course. Yeah, this um, one was was rather, as I said, painstaking. We went through some some major heck, if you will. So uh, I yeah, I'm happy we made it through. Absolutely, I completely agree. Uh, but you know what? It's late, guys. I'm a little hungry. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so uh, with that said, folks, my name is Eric. I'm Justin. This was Paratruth Radio. So until next week, we'll see you at same time, same place. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, paratruthradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day.